you know tonight that I love my city. I love, I love where we're at. I love where God has brought Bethany and I too. I love that we have been able to call this place home. And, and we feel like we feel like God, I mean, we just feel all over us. God destined for us to be here. And it's just an amazing time. And when I got back, I was thinking, okay, God, where, where do we go from here? We had a great time of camp. And we're, we're heading into, you know, the school year and things like that. What is it that, you know, you have in store for us? And God laid a verse on my heart when I was reading. And I'm going to share that with you a little bit later. But he, laid, he just laid this verse out. It wasn't a long verse. And I read it, and I just began to sit back and think. And I just began to really think about our city. I mean, to think about just where we live at and surrounding areas. And a lot of times when I talk to people, they're not, they either have never ever heard of Altoona. And when you're talking to people, like, yeah, I live in Altoona. They're like, where's that? And then you guys say, okay, it's like, what, 40 minutes from State College, by State University. That's the closest thing. And I'm like, oh, okay. Or then the people say, oh, you're from Altoona. That explains a lot. And I'm like, what was that? Are you be serious? But uh, there is just this reputation about Altoona. And people from the outside have it, and some from the inside have it. Where they think Altoona and the area is just a dump. It's, it's a stupid city. Um, it's a stupid town that is very oppressed. It's just a very depressed place. And, and people are just bums and nobody does anything in there. There is this, this concept of our city that so many people have. But as well, we have it too. And so now I'm going to challenge you through the Word of God to look at your city completely different. I believe that so many people have really just given up. I believe that sometimes we reach a point, especially as a teenager, where we have tried so hard maybe to reach our high school. We have tried so hard to win our middle school for Jesus. And we have tried and tried and tried, and nothing happens. <laughs> so what do we do? We give up. We quit. We start a Bible club and it starts to go really, really good. It starts off with like 30, 40 people. And then a few weeks later, it's down to like three or four. So what do we do? We close the door and we kind of just stop and we quit on our schools and we quit on trying to reach our friends and we quit on trying to reach our city. And I think so many people have forgotten the vision of capturing the city for the sake of Jesus. And I use that word capture because I believe that that's what God has commanded us to do. And I believe that there's a generation of teenagers that are rising up that are going to go into the surrounding area and they are literally going to capture it and hold it captive for the name of Jesus. And I believe it's something that he has really called us to do. And for some of you, you think, okay, I hate this place. I cannot wait to get out of here. I don't know why anyone would want to live in this place. It's depressing. It's dumb. It's stupid. There's nothing that ever goes on. And I don't like being here. Well, that might be your attitude, but I want to tell you tonight that do you know that God has specifically designed you and destined for you to be in the city? It wasn't just a coincidence that your family lived here. It's not just an accident that maybe your mom or dad moved here from somewhere else. But very simply, God destined each and every one of you to live where you're at today. I want you to check out this verse in Acts Chapter, it's going to be on the screen if you want to throw that up in Acts. Chapter 17, verses 26 through 27. It says, From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far from any one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being. As some, of you, as some of your own poets have said, we are His offspring. And what I, what I want you to see in this verse are two things. Number one is that He marked out their appointed times in history for you to be here. So for those of you that think, you know, oh, I'm here just because of the state. It's not a mistake. God had marked out an appointed time on His huge calendar in heaven that you would be destined to be here for a purpose. And then He said, so what are you here for? You're here to seek Him and perhaps reach out for Him and find Him. Meaning you are here to seek the heart of God and then help others reach and seek the heart of God. That is what He is destined for you to be. And tonight God has laid it on my heart to talk to you about loving your city. To love the city that you are in. And it's based 
basically, we live in a land. It's called the land of the lost. I mentioned to it, I think I mentioned it either at camp or a few weeks ago, that the whole concept of the, you know, the, the, the new big thing is zombies. <laughs> and what, what, is, what is the big show right now? Walking Dead. Walking Dead. All right. Huh? Duck Dynasty, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. But no, listen, check this out. Society has, has just got so fascinated with this concept of the living dead. And, and that's all well, and zombies have been around for many, many years. This concept of the living dead has been around for a long, long time. But do you know it is very real in the spiritual realm that you and I live and we walk among the dead? Every day that we walk down our hallways to school, every day that we walk down the boulevard and in front of our house, we are walking among the dead. Because those who have Christ are a new creation. They are found in Him. They have life. Christ said, I've come to give you life. Those that don't have life are dead. So there's this concept that we live in the land of the lost, the land of the dead. And what we need to do is we need to bring them what we have. I oftentimes talk about this illustration. I want you to imagine that this whole section here, that you, that you have this antidote, that you have this medicine, that you keep so securely, and you have it, and it can cure someone who's dying. And then these two sections, you are a dying generation. You have this disease that is literally killing you. And if you do not get the medicine, you're going to die. Now, naturally, what we would do is if we had the medicine and we had the cure for the disease, we would give it up to them. And we would give it to every single one of them because we don't want them to die. We don't want them to perish. We don't want them to, to be gone forever. We want to give them what we have. Spiritually, it's the same thing. As Christians, we have the answer to a lot of questions. And we have the, the life answer to a dying generation. A dying generation that is in their sin, that is separated from God, we have the answer to provide for them. So my first point that I'm going to tell you tonight is this. We want our city, we want them to have what we have. What do we have? We have Jesus. That's what we have. And I don't know about you, but I want my city to have what I have. And what I have is Jesus. And what's cool about Jesus is Jesus has many different names that kind of cover every aspect of our life. If we need a healer, a doctor, Jesus is our healer. We need a provider, the name of Jesus is a provider. We need comfort, he's comfort. We need joy, he's joy. We need peace, he's peace. There are so many different names for God and for Jesus. And our city needs to hear the name of Jesus. They need to know that. They need to know who Jesus is. And what's very interesting is that we find in Luke chapter 14, if you have your Bibles, flip over, flip over to Luke chapter 14. And I want to read this to you. It says, there he turned to the host. The next time you put a dinner on, don't just invite your friends and family and rich neighbors, the kind of people who return the favor. Invite some people who have never got invited. Invite the misfits, the ones from the wrong side of the tracks. You'll be and experience a blessing. They won't be able to return the favor, but the favor will be returned. Oh, how it will be returned? It will be returned at the resurrection of God's people. And it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting passage of scripture. Because I know that I have someone that I would want to come to my house to eat. There's a certain type of person that I would like to have come over. I would especially like to have someone come over that then after I invited them over, they would invite me over to eat. Because that's how we are. I do something for you, you do something for me. I give to you, you give back to me. It's an expectancy that our culture has taught us. But what Jesus is saying here is saying, listen, don't just invite your friends and the people that you like and the people that you're close with. Invite the very people to your house that are misfits to the world that might be on the other side of the tracks. 
Well, what are the other side of the tracks? Well, we always have this analogy. There are those that live right, live good, and have the nice vehicles, and have the nice cars, have the nice family, have all the nice stuff over here. And then on the other side of the tracks, we live in kind of a dumpy house. Our cars don't really run right. We may walk everywhere. We don't have money. All these different stuff. And so these other type of people. Jesus is reaching out and saying, hey, I want you to invite the least of these. The least of these. So I want you to keep this passage in your mind, and I want you to picture Jesus talking about this. But what I want you to do, Justin, if you can hit the lights for me, I have a short video that I want you to see that's going to illustrate the rest of this passage of Scripture so that you can kind of see where we are going with this. A man once gave a great banquet and invited a lot of guests. When the banquet was ready, he sent a servant to tell the guests, Everything is ready, please come. One guest after another started making excuses. The first one said, I bought some land and I've got to look it over, please excuse me. Another guest said, I bought five teams of oxen and I need to try them out, please excuse me. Still another guest said, I've just gotten married and I can't be there. The servant told his master what happened. The master became so angry that he said, Go as fast as you can to every street and alley in town. Bring in everyone who is poor or crippled or blind or lame. When the servant returned, he said, Master, I've done what you told me, and there is still plenty of room for more people. His master then told him, Go out along the back routes and fence rows and make people come in so that my house will be full. Not one of the guests I first invited will even get a bite of my food. Saying, I'm giving you this invite 
to spend eternity with me, have a great banquet, have a great eternity with me. And the truth is, is some will accept it, and some will not accept it. And what you are called to do, you are called to be that servant to go out and to invite people to come to the great banquet. You are the servant that is called to go and invite your friends to come to know Jesus. You are the one that is called to go invite your family to come to know who Jesus is. And so why, you know, why do we do this? Why do we go out this well? I want you to understand something. When you fall in love with Jesus, you want other people to know who Jesus is. But sometimes, telling people about Jesus stretches us. Because we're comfortable in who we are, and we're in our little comfort zone, and we like being kind of just keeping it to ourselves and everything like that. But you need to stretch. Why must you stretch? You must stretch because when you stretch, you can reach your full potential. Justin, I believe that there's a slide. Yeah, you can reach your full potential. See, you have really no idea how far God can take you under the influence of the Holy Spirit and how much He can stretch you. You have no far. You have no idea how far He can take you. Many of you know this, and I've talked about it before. I did not take one class of youth ministry in Bible college because I hated to approach Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. It's that simple. It says, as Jesus approached Jerusalem, and he saw his city, he wept over it. I want you to understand something. The man that we are talking about is the Son of God, Jesus. Not a big crybaby, not a big pansy man, not a big whiner. This is Jesus that we are talking about. The man of men. The, the, this is the Son of God. But yet when he wept, when he saw his city, Jerusalem, he wept over his city. There's something just, when I read this, I began to think, man, this is, this is intense. That Jesus saw Jerusalem, his city, and he wept over it. Do you know why he wept over his city? He was weeping over the tragedy of lost opportunity. He was weeping because he is not willing that any should perish. Meaning that Jesus looked into Jerusalem and he knew that there were people there that would not accept him. And that broke his heart. Jesus had a heart for the city of Jerusalem. He had a heart. He stood there, he looked up, and he looked over his city. And it broke his heart to know that there are people that live in that city over there that would die and not encounter him. That would not come into a relationship with him. And it was a tragedy to him. I believe that God is calling us to look upon our city. And weep for our sin. I'm not saying that you have to physically cry, but I'm saying your heart should break, knowing that there are people out there who don't know Jesus. That if they die today, they will die and go to hell. And they will be eternally separated from the presence of God. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. His heart was broken. To me, it's a touching thing. To see anyone weeping. There's something just infectious about tears. When we see a child or a young person in tears, it has an effect upon us. When we see someone cry, there's just, there's just this sympathy and feeling that comes over us. However, the stronger the person who weeps, the more powerful the effect is upon us. Men that are big, strong men that say, oh, we don't ever cry. When you see them cry, there is an effect that has on us and a sympathy that comes over us by seeing a strong man weeping like a child. As we grow older, we weep more in secret, less in public. If we are here simply looking at the case of a great man weeping, it should be touching enough. But what is more important, this isn't just a great man, that this is the Son of God that is weeping over his city. If this doesn't move you, I don't know what will. That Jesus, the Son of God, went over his city.
because they wanted, he wanted so bad for this city to encounter Jesus. Jesus had a heart for this city. Jesus knew how powerful the love of his father was, and he wanted people to have it. He also knew what would happen if they rejected it. So it hurt Jesus to know some people were going to miss out on the opportunity. It hurt him. Physically hurt him because he knew that they would be missing out. So we need to have a heart for our city. But then what also we need to have, not just pray and have a heart for our city, but the next thing is this. What we need to do is we need to stir each other to love and to do good. To love and to do good. We need to stir each other in love. And we need to stir each other to love and to do good. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says this. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more, as you see the day drawing near. Listen to me. In some of us, especially guys, there is something inside of us where we like to just stir up aggravation in certain people. You don't know what I'm talking about. Like, you just know what you can do to annoy that certain person. You know that. Many of you know that if you would have sat with me at a cafeteria table and you started playing a cup game, I'd break the cup over your head. Because if you would sit there and stir me on and spur me on and, and it, you know it would get to me. As teenagers, we like to start stuff just for the sake of starting stuff. There's something inside of us as humans where we love to annoy each other just for the simple fact that it annoys them. <laughs> this is what you hear, like, hey, watch this. And then you know what you do. And you stir that aggravation, that annoyance, that anger, until someone just wants to pop you in the face. Some of you are like, yeah, that's totally good. I know, I'm that person. Ask Bethany, she'll tell you. Ask Pastor Wayne, ask Pastor Jim, ask the band. I love to just, mm, especially with Brent, it's so easy. It's so easy. But see, what, the, what this verse is telling us is that we need to stir something up inside of each other. Something needs to be stirred up when I get next to you. Something needs to, there needs to be something that is stirred up that one of them, that we consider, hey, you know what? I need to be around people who are passionate about God. Because when I go to conferences and I go to places and I hear people speak, I get fired up. I do. I get fired up. I'm ready to come home and preach to everybody. I'm ready to walk down the neighborhood and just tell everybody about Jesus. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're big, you're tall, you're a cat, you're a dog. I will get you saved. Why? Because something is stirred up inside of me. When you're around people who are passionate about God, something begins to stir up inside of you. The Bible is telling us that we should stir each other up but to love and to do good works. To love. To love and to do good works. When you're around people that genuinely love people, it can rub off on you. When you're around people that just love being around people and hanging out with people, it rubs off on you and it stirs something up inside of you because you want to be like that. As Christians, we need to stir each other up. Hey, love, love your school. Love your parents. Do good. Do the good works that you're called to do. And we need to stir each other up. It shouldn't be that you come on a Tuesday and a Wednesday or a Sunday or you go to the door during the week and, and, and Dave or I stir you up. You as a generation need to stir each other up to win this city for Jesus. Because see, it is so vital that you be here that you're part of a family of believers each week. Because whether you believe it or not, God wants you here. He wants you to be here and serve with your church family. Because the church is the hope of the world. And as messed up and as jacked up and as crazy as the church per se is, the church 
is still called to be the hope of the world. I know that church hasn't always done the right thing, and I know there aren't the best examples out there about church. But the church is really, is, is the church, what it is, is, is people that come together that have a relationship with Jesus. And they go out there and they get people, and they tell people about Jesus, and they come in. And it's this cycle that goes where you tell people about Jesus, they can say they come to church. They tell people about Jesus, they can say they come to church. And we as a body, together, go out and tell people about Jesus. Why? Because this is our church. This is the Refuge Youth Church. We come together, and we are the hope of the generation out there that is lost. Did you know that? You and every one of you, every one of you that is in here, we are the hope. We are the hope. Why? Because we carry the hope of Christ with us that we offer to the world. So we are the hope. The church is the hope of the world. Romans 12, 5 says this, In Christ... We, through many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Just like we have a body. I have fingers, but they belong to my body. I have feet, but they belong to my body. We are a body that belong one to another. Romans 1.16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. How does that get accomplished? How do we bring salvation to those that believe and work together as a body? See, my brain tells my body what to do. If one day my brain decides, you know what? Left leg, you're not going to work today. I'm in trouble. I'm either walking like a gangster or I'm not walking at all, okay? I'm going to be walking like this, you know, down the road, and people are going to think, okay, what is wrong with him? But if my brain decides to tell my body not to do something, it won't do it. The body works perfectly together. The brain sends signals to, to my nerves, my nerves heal my muscles, my muscles tell it, and I begin to walk and I begin to move. Why? Because everything in my body needs one another. They need one another to work. And I want, you, I want everybody to look at me. I want you to hear what I'm about to tell you. This body, this church, this refuge youth church, it needs you. I want you to hear that from me. That this, this ministry, this body of believers, it needs you. Understand, it doesn't need you to be to make it big, to make it awesome. It needs you so that we can be most effective for Christ. It needs you because we need one another. I need you. The leadership team needs you. We need you. We need us to be together, to come together, and to be most effective because we're whole. This ministry needs every single one of you so that we can go out and do what God has called us to do. You know, you might be here tonight and you don't think very highly of yourself because what you have done in your past or what you're doing now, but I want you to understand one thing. If God can use anybody, He can use you. If God can use me and my messed up past, God can use you. If God can use other pastors that, that are ready, if He can use the leaders here, He can use every one of you. And listen to me, I want you to realize that God created me and you for the service of the church. He created us to do this, to, to be here, to, to learn about Him, and to go out and tell others about Him. He created you and me for the service. It is God who has saved us, and He has chosen us for His holy work. That's what 2 Timothy 1 9 says. Let me say that again. It is God who saved us and chose us for His holy work. So God saved you and then He chose you to do His work. Whether you want it or not, you are chosen. You go in a relationship with God, you're chosen. To do the work that He has called you to do, you are chosen by God. To go out and to preach the gospel of good news. 
You were chosen to win this city. I want you to understand that, each and every one of you. You, being here tonight, you were chosen to win this city. God has equipped you to do this. He has called every one of you that is in here tonight, He has called you to change, transform, and win this city. You were chosen. Every one of you that is in here tonight, you were chosen for this. Ephesians 2.10 says this. We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Where are you at? We, you and me, were created by God to do handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And God prepared it all in advance for us to do. So there is a mission that God has laid out before us that He is preparing us to do. And whether you believe it or not, you are sent here and you are raised here to, to fulfill the plans that God has. He's prepared you for this. He is preparing you for this. Why? Because you're His handiwork. And I want you to understand something about God's handiwork. The handiwork of God is always a masterpiece. The handiwork of God is always a masterpiece. Look at your friend, look at your neighbor and say, I'm a masterpiece. Okay, don't say it so arrogantly, okay? You're not that great. Oh. But listen to me. You are a masterpiece. Okay. Created by God. His handiwork. What does that mean? That means that God, with His hands, created you for a certain purpose. He handcrafted you, designed you to do something. What did He design you to do with His hands? He designed you to be in this place, to be in this city, to love this city, and to change it. That is what He has created you to do. It was a premeditated thought of God. This is what He has called you to do. He gifted you to serve not only this church, but the community. Not only were you created for service, but you were created to serve, and you have skills to do it. You do. You have skills to do it. Whether you want to believe it or not, you can. You can do this. God has created inside of you that you would have the skills and the proper things to tell the world about Jesus. 1 Peter 4.10 says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. 1 Corinthians 12.5 says, There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. Some of you are athletes. You've been blessed with a gift to play sports. You can use that to your benefit, and you can still serve God by playing sports. Because you can reach out to your whole team. Those of you that are the artsy fartsy ones. I say that with respect, because if you ever see my stick figure, you'd laugh, okay? So let's just say that. I do appreciate good art. Why? Because my art is not good, alright? But those of you that are in that whole art world, whether it's dance or theater or tattoos, whatever it is, listen to me, whatever it is, God has blessed you in the service and He has blessed you with a gift to reach out to people. He's given you certain skills. Some of you, you're very introverted, but you can write beautiful literature, beautiful poems and stories. God has given you a gift. And that gift he has given to you, you can give back to him to serve so that people can come to know who Jesus is. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, to equip his people for service so the body of Christ might be built up. Some of you, like me, you have a little bit of athletic skill, you have no art skill, you couldn't dance if your life depended on it, but he has called you
to be in the ministry. He has called you to be a teacher, a preacher, an evangelist. He has called you to, to be a prophet, an apostle, whatever it is. He has called you for this purpose. Because why? Because the church family is going to need you. And I mean the church family. I mean Christians around the world are going to need the gifts that God has given to you. Some of you, in the last three years when I met you, you had one idea of what you wanted to be. Now some of you are, are saying, you know what, I think, I, think, I think God is calling me to go to Bible college. I think God is calling me to go into the ministry. I think God is calling me to be a youth pastor. That's exciting for me. I love that. You're not taking my job, but I am excited for you. I want you to use the skills that God has blessed you with. But like we talked about this past week, where it all starts is serving. It starts with the mindset that I will serve. 1 Peter 4.10 says, Each of you should use whatever gift you receive to serve others as a faithful steward of God's grace in various forms. Mark 10.45 says this, For even Jesus, the Son of Man, did not come to be served, but to serve. And he gave his life as a ransom for men. If I were to say and give you a job description, and I were to say, you know what? Your job description is you're going to be a servant. That is what you're called to do. If you were to come and if I were to give you to, uh, you were to come and work for me and say, well, your whole job is you serve. That's what you do. You're a servant. Many of you be like, forget that. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to be a servant. I'm not doing this. Why? And let me tell you why. Why? Because we're very egocentrical. We, the, it's about us. Our mind says, I don't serve. People serve me. I don't do it for people. They do it for me. And that's the society that we live in. I'm just going to be blunt. Our society tells us to have other people do it. Not to serve. And see, again, again, Jesus' teachings go against everything that the world is telling us we should do. His teaching is telling you, you need to serve people. You need to follow me, and you need to serve people. How do you serve people? You serve them by offering up your talents, your gifts, by what you can do. And you offer, the, the, the big thing about being a servant is you are willing to do what no one else wants to do. That's serving. Willing to do what really nobody else wants to do. There are so many in our city who need Jesus. Oftentimes the Bible talks about the lost as a harvest. It's a farming term. Some of you have been on a farm. Some of you have never been on a farm. Some of you are terrified of farms. So, but those of you that have ever been ever around farming, there's this concept of harvesting. And listen to me. We pray, we have the heart of God, we come to church, we work together, we serve the community, and let me tell you, all of these things, what they add up to, they add up to a harvest. That there is a harvest of people and of souls and of friends that are out there. Matthew 9, 36 through 38 says this, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were confused. And they were helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, listen to me, I want you to hear what he says here. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray that the Lord, who is in charge of the harvest, ask him to send more workers into the fields. Let me just be blunt and tell you what this is saying. It's saying that there's a generation out there that's lost, but only a few people are willing to do what it takes to get them. There's only a few people that are willing to work, to go out and to, to get the harvest and bring it in. Even in this room, there's only a few students who really would go into their schools and want to do everything they can to change them. He's saying there's such a harvest out there, but the people that want to work for it, it's very few. And why do I talk about this tonight? Because I believe in our city, the city that we live in, 
the city that we are called to love, that there is a great harvest of people who need to know Jesus. And it is you that is commissioned to go into that harvest and to work and to do it. Farming is not fun. You don't get joy out of harvesting wheat or picking cotton or picking corn. It's not a glamorous thing. It is work that you have to do. Just like spreading the gospel of Jesus' work. It's not always going to be easy, but it's what you are called to do. I believe this was my whole heart, young people. Listen to me today. I believe that if you fall in love with your city, you fall in love with your school, truly fall in love like Jesus loved Jerusalem, you love your school, you love your city, and you begin to pray for it, and your heart begins to grow, and you begin to serve your city, I believe that God will send you out to get the harvest, to tell the world about who Jesus is. If I were to ask you tonight, how many of you want to see your friends and family saved? Raise your hand. Honestly, how many want to see your friends, your family, your school? How many? Lift it high. Lift it high. I want everybody to see. How many of you want to see this accomplished? But the question is, okay, you see the hands that are raised. I think every single person in this room raised their hand. Every one of you did. But what are you willing to do to make it happen? The first step is falling in love with your city. Falling in love with the people that are in your city. Falling in love with the students that maybe nobody wants to talk to. Nobody wants anything to do with. You start school in just a few weeks. And what a better way to start school this year with a mindset that I'm going to love my city and I'm going to love my school more than anything. And I'm going to tell people about Jesus. And let me explain something to you. See, as teenagers, we get hyped up when we experience God. And so what we do, we think this, walking through a hallway is telling people about Jesus. Hey, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Walking down the street. Jesus loves you. Listen to me. That is not spreading the gospel of Jesus. Because there are many people that are out there that might know that Jesus loves them. But what they're trying to learn is how to love Jesus back. You want people to encounter who Jesus is. And you want to fall in love with your city. Whether you live in Holidaysburg, whether you live in Altoona, Tyrone, Bella, Tipton State College, wherever you might live, you need to fall in love with your city. So that your city can come to know who Jesus is. And it will come, not just by you telling them, but by you acting it out. Being commissioned to go and to do what God has called you to do. In a few weeks, we're going to do our See You at the Pole Rally. And we're going to do it how we do it every year. And we're going to have it, you know, we're going to have a great time. It's going to be a great time and we are going to commission you again this year to be campus missionaries, to go into your schools and be missionaries to the schools that are there. To be missionaries to your friends, to your teachers. Last year, we had a girl lead her teacher to Jesus. A student. So see, it's not just about your friends and the people that you're hanging out with. There are teachers, principals, administrators, secretaries, cafeteria workers, janitors. There are so many different people that are going to be in your school that are going to need to know that Jesus loves them. But the question is, is what are you willing to do? My challenge to you tonight is to change your mindset and your mentality and say at the end of the day, you know what, God, thank you for placing me where I am at. Because I truly do. I love my city. And I'm going to do what it takes to win my city. By your head,